teacher for us and you also. The teachers are also money oriented. They're not giving the proper us and yoga education. Yes, it's become commercial. So much yes. And another thing, Maharaj, Arjuna himself, who is such a great archer, he was you know, he is ambidextrous, he, he used to, he is Gudakesha, such a great person, he is rejecting Ashtanga Yoga, saying that he will not be able to perform that yoga. So we are much, much, nothing compared to Arjuna, so how can we perform? Yes, okay. Yes, difficult. <laughs> if it's difficult for Arjuna. But how in Krishna conscious principles of Astanga Yoga can be followed? So Yama and Niyama are there. We have our Yama and Niyama. Yes. So we followed. In Krishna consciousness we have Yama and Niyama. Regulations we followed and no's, don'ts are there. Yeah. Haraj, we follow celibacy. Follow celibacy. Follow celibacy. Well, you know, in Bhakti Yoga, it's not as strict as in Astanga Yoga. In Bhakti Yoga, there is health, householder life and there is producing children in God consciousness. So, in Astanga Yoga, it's total celibacy. So, some, some difference there. Astanga Yoga, they have to be totally celibate to practice Astanga Yoga. But in Krishna Bhakti Yoga, you can be married and you can have children in Krishna Consciousness. So some, some difference there. So control of mind, Maharaj, we also control our minds. Uh, even in Bhakti Yoga, we control our mind, but we control our minds by engaging our mind in higher uh, taste. Paramdhashtva uh, Nivartate. We do the same thing as Ashtanga Yogis, we also control our mind, but a different method methodology to control the other district. Okay. You don't do any asanas? <laughs> no, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, chanting 15 rounds at ha one sitting and Hare attending Mangala Arati every day. Hare Krishna, the devotees are all fat and stiff. They're all overweight, right? They need to do some, ast uh, some astanga yoga to get thin. They should do more asanas. <laughs> Um, you do offer obeisances, Maharaj. Yes, yeah, we do. We do. We, if you do it, if you follow all the things we're supposed to do, you keep healthy. Dancing in the kirtan. If you get if you get Indra Jumna Swami coming along and having kirtan, I told Krishna Prabhu told me he said when he was a young devotee he was in the temple and <laughs> Indra Jumna Swami came up to him and said, "Get your lead boots off." <laughs> I said, get up, get your, take your lead boots off and start dancing because I told Krishna, I said, he wasn't dancing in the kirtan. So I told Krishna Maharaj, uh, rather uh, Indra Dhamna Maharaj was, uh, <laughs> he didn't like to see people stand around, he wanted everybody to dance in the kirtan. <laughs> so I told Krishna was telling me like that. Hmm. So dance, you dance in the kirtan, you chant and dance and you offer obeisances all the time, especially you go in Parikrama, the holy places, you're bowing down all the time, up and down, offer, and you meet devotees offering obeisances all the time. Yeah, so we get a lot of exercise if you take part in all the programs. We get some asana. What about pranayama? Chanting, Maharaj, right? Chanting, we do get the benefit of pranayama. Yeah, right. If we do the chanting, you get good pranayama. And meditation, prachahara, how is your prachahara? Are you attached to a lot of material things? We do all these upvasana, right? Doing ekadashi, janmastamis, uh, all those, we stay away from things and we dedicate in Krishna's worship. Okay. okay, yeah, we do some austerity. Okay, and then Srila Prabhupada's purports and lectures on the yoga system described in Bhagavad Gita, reflecting his mood and mission. So that was mainly about preaching, that Prabhupada wanted that we should preach. 
tell people about the real yoga. Real yoga is bhakti yoga. And the goal of all the yogas is to come to bhakti yoga. And the other yogas are just leading to bhakti yoga. So we try we get a lot of preaching in the yoga studios around the world. They do like kirtan, they invite the devotees to come and do kirtan and it's very good. Distribute books there, meet people. Okay, then let's look at chapter six. Chapter six begins with the description of the different levels of yoga. Yoga Rurukshore is for the neophyte, the beginner. One just began yoga practice and yoga rudra is for one who is perfect in yoga practice. And so different levels of yoga will be there. It's not that everybody is the same. There's going to be different levels. And just like in bhakti yoga, we have different levels of devotees. And so in yoga practice, a different level, described in the first nine verses. And then Lord Krishna goes on to describe about different stages in the yoga practice, the eight stages and the goal of coming to samadhi. And then it leads into realization of Lord Krishna as the super soul. To come to samadhi, we hope the yogi will realize Lord Krishna is the super soul and we're not we're not the super soul. <laughs> Some yogis are unfortunate and they think they are the super soul. They, they can't distinguish between Krishna and themselves. And so they think they are the super soul. That's the unfortunate yogis. And then we all hear about Astanga Yoga rejected by Arjuna, or we heard already, Arjuna said too difficult for him, he couldn't control the mind. And what did Krishna say when Arjuna said, too difficult to control the mind? How did Krishna respond? Did like he, this one, like huh? this. Yeah, what else? Only practice? One more thing. Uh, determination. No, not determination. What was the other? Detachment. Detachment. Yes, detachment. Abhyasena tu kuntiya vairagena chakriyate. Vairag. Right? Abhyas and vairag. So detachment. So it has to be that constant practice. You want to control the mind, you want to conquer over the senses, it's not going to be so easy. It's going to be constant struggle. We have to make some endeavor. It's a challenge. But it's a great achievement. Then one can experience real peace and happiness if we get control over the mind and senses. So Arjuna was saying, very difficult, very difficult. But Krishna said, well, I know it's difficult, but it's possible by constant practice and detachment. And now we're going to hear today about the destination of the unsuccessful yogi. Not all yogis are successful. Hmm? Successful, what's the difference between the successful yogi and the unsuccessful yogi? Anybody? Uh, Maharaj, yes, successful, uh, successful yogi will be one who has seen the Paramatma within his heart because that's what he's trying to achieve. And unsuccessful yogi is one who has not yet achieved uh, this stage of Samadhi where he uh, can see the Paramatma within. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, might be like that, yeah. Yes, Prabhu? I have one doubt, I have one doubt over here. Mm -hmm. Can we say it like this, that, you know, no matter whether one is successful or unsuccessful, all the yogis are unsuccessful only, because in the end they will merge into, you know, Brahman realization, and from there they will come back again. Or is it something else? You know, what is the gati, like, what is the final achievement that they get? that one can get out of yoga. Yes, that's if right. It, if, it, if, if he is not practicing bhakti, then ultimately he will only merge into this, the highest... Can you hear me? No, Maharaj. Huh? No, you can hear me. Yes, Maharaj. 
Yes, Maharaj. Okay, we got disconnected for a minute there. The internet's unstable as usual here. This is a constant battle. Yes, yeah, successful yogi goes back to Godhead. He doesn't take birth again in the material world. But if that successful yogi is not following the path of bhakti, still he will go back to Godhead? Well, if he's not following the path of bhakti, he's not going to go back to Godhead. Right? Where's he going to go? He may go to the Brahman, the jnanis like that, may go to the Brahman, but as you said, they'll come back again. You cannot just simply remain in the Brahman. They'll stay there for some time and then they may come back again because they're not properly situated. So that's, uh, impersonal liberation is like theoretical liberation, but it's not actual liberation. They have to c return to the material world. Lord Krishna says, uh, those great souls who are yogis in devotion, they never return to the material world because they know it's a temporary place of misery. Right? So the yogis in devotion, they're not going to come back. But these other people, they're, they're not bhakta, they're not bhakti yogis. They have to come back. If they, they may get impersonal liberation, they may not. You don't know. A lot of yogis, where do they go? They just want yoga cities. Yoga cities, that's, they've got, they want to enjoy the yoga powers. They'll stay in the material world. Right? Swami Ramdev and all these people, you know, they get caught up in the, in the commercial aspects. <laughs> yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. You have a question? Maharaj, so yes. yes, yes, Maharaj. So so even though they are aspiring, like even though they are meditating on Paramatma within their heart, still they achieve only impersonal liberation. Well, we have to consider what is their object of the meditation. You see, do they, have they distinguished between themselves and the Paramatma? Or are they thinking it's just one? They're thinking we're all, you know, Tatvamasi, we're all the Paramatma, we're all one. They, they have material desires. They want the yoga perfections. It's not that they're without desire. Right? So, so there's a verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Bhukti Mukti Siddhikami Sakale Ashanta Krishna Bhakti Niskam Sa Eshashanta That if they desire Bhukti, material enjoyment, or mukti, liberation, or siddhi, the yoga perfections, they cannot be peaceful because they have these desires. They have some material desire. On bhukti, but Krishna bhakti niskam saesha shanta. The devotee has no material desire, so he is peaceful. So these yogis, they may be meditating on the super soul, but what is the object of their meditation? Do they have the mood of giving service to the super soul? That is the point. You meditate, okay, you, you realize the super soul, you, you have to realize your relationship with the super soul and become the servant. Then you go on from there. Right? So, Maharaj, if they realize that they are meant to serve the Lord, then they elevate to the Vaikuntha planet. That is Bhakti Madhava. Yes, that's Bhakti. If they realize the Lord and they know they're the servant, become the servant, yeah. 
then they can go to Baikunta. Yeah, they have. The so Ma Maharaji, can can we take like this that you know apart from bhakti there is no process or no other way by which even you know yogis who want to meditate on Paramatma or who want to you know do something for Paramatma or who want to you know acquire that Vaikuntha even that is not possible without bhakti. For that also bhakti is required. Yes, there has to be some bhakti. But there has to be that desire, no desire, no material desire, you know. They, although there's some bhakti there, but it's mixed with their material desires. Hmm. It's not pure devotion, it's mixed devotion. Right? We want pure devotion. You want to go back to Godhead? We've got to be, we've got to have pure devotion. Rupa Goswami's nectar of devotion is all about pure devotion. Pure devotion means no material desires. All right, so we have to get free of the, the desire for fruitivity and the desire for liberation as well. The desire for impersonal liberation is also material. That's the qualification to go back to God. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question. Uh, I have a question in this regard. Actually, I heard like uh, this, uh, like the devotional service. But this starts from the platform of Dasya. But those who are on the Shanta platform, they don't do any active service. So uh, what I've heard is uh, like uh, those who are like yogis, they see the Lord, but they don't want to do service to Him. These are the people who achieve uh, shantaras and they become like trees or something. They don't actively serve, but they go to uh, Vaikuntha. So is that right, Maharaj, then? Or? Yes, that's, that's, sounds right. Shantaras, yeah, they appreciate the opulence of Krishna, but they don't take up service. Maybe things like, you say, like trees, it can, sometimes it can be animals also. Yeah. They have the mood. They just appreciate Krishna's beauty. They're attracted, but they don't do service. They're engaged in service. So that's Shantaras. But of course, they, they may go to Vaikuntha Dasti and they may go on from there. Just like if you read Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, we read about Gopkumar, you know, going to the spiritual world and Yes, seeing the different places and experiencing the different rasas and moving on so you find your actual position where you're satisfied which is according to our nature according to our swaru so shantaras is not really devotional that there's some tinge of impersonalism there so Lord Chaitanya says Jivarsvarapaha Nitya Krishna Das right he encourages service so we want to do service the media, our Krishna consciousness movement is all about engaging in service we don't want people just only to appreciate, oh, Krishna is very nice. We want them to take up service, do some service. And that, that's better. Active service. The, this, this section of the Bhagavad Gita is explaining that active service is much better than people who are not active. The impersonalists like that, the jnanis and you know, they want to stop everything, no activities. So their position is not very secure. But the devotee's position is secure if he's fully engaged in Krishna conscious activities. Then he's got more security there, he's safer there in that position. Active engagement. So Prabhupada uh, certainly utilized that principle keeping the devotees always busy, you know, book distribution, 
when we distributed books, then he would say double it. <laughs> We'd all, we'd all been working to the maximum and then Prabhupada said, oh, very good, now double it next year. You know, <laughs> Prabhupada was, was just pushing us, pushing us, you know, to keep us, keep us busy. Because he knew if, if we became proud and if we slackened and eased off, then we'd get in Maya. So he always wanted to keep us busy in Krishna's service. He's always wanted to know, how many books have you distributed? How many new devotees have you made? How many properties have you acquired? <laughs> you know, Prabhupada, you know, it wasn't like he was materialistic, but he just wanted to see, to make sure the devotees are working hard in Krishna's service, trying to push on the Krishna consciousness movement. We may be successful, we may not. That's not important, but he liked to see that we're active. One time in London, I remember, we had a very small temple, a very small center, and it was really crowded with devotees, it was really packed. And so a devotee was thinking to buy one building, a big church in the center of London. And he sent a picture to Prabhupada and he said, what do you think, Prabhupada, can we buy this building? And Prabhupada, says, Prabhupada said, oh yeah, go ahead, buy it. <laughs> With no money. <laughs> Prabhupada, and then Prabhupada, he told the devotee, he said, try to hunt the rhino. He said, when you go hunting, hunt the rhino. He said, go for something big. And he said, don't think small. One devotee was describing, he said, Prabhupada was in Vrindavan and the uh, devotee was saying to him, he said, Prabhupada, why don't we get a place like, uh, like the Radha Damodar temple, a little place in the center of the Bara Bazaar, in the in center of the, the bazaar there, in the center of the marketplace. But Prabhupada said, no, no, he said, I don't, he said, I cannot think small. He said, I have this disease. He said, I cannot think small. We have to do something big. And so, you know, Krishna arranged they could get that land at uh, Raman Reti, where Krishna Balaram Mandir is. So Prabhupada didn't want to just make a little small temple like Radha Damodar or these other temples, some of the temples there in Vrindam. He wanted a big temple, you know like Radha Govinda temple. <laughs> he liked to do something big for Krishna. And so Prabhupada encouraged us also to think big. It meant we always have to work hard, you have to work really hard. You have to think how to do these things. And and then, of course, if, if he said, oh, it's too difficult, it's impossible, Prabhupada would say, no, no, nothing is impossible. That's a word in the Fool's Dictionary. And so, there was no question of saying impossible to Prabhupada. You have to do it. You have to try. Okay. So, Shantaras, Mm, that's just, <laughs> there's no active service, you're not, you're not very secure. Some people may have that rasa, they may be in that rasa, but you have to be careful. Or even the cows, they're rendering service, the trees are also doing service, they're giving fruits, you see them bending, bowing down to Krishna. And so, in some aspects, there is also service there in these different species of life. And the parrots, they're taking messages between Radha and Krishna. You know, they're, they're, they've all got some kind of engagement. And some devotees, they take these different bodies. In the spiritual world, there's all kinds of different living entities and different trees and creepers. And pure devotees, they're all pure devotees, and they take these different bodies, 
just for the pleasure of Krishna, to give Krishna pleasure. So it, it's difficult for us to fully appreciate all these different living entities and how they're all pure devotees, but they can take all of these different forms just, just for giving pleasure to Krishna. You know, being a bee, the bumblebee, flying around Krishna's garland. Maharaj, I have another question. Yes, Prabhu. How these things can be in Chandras then? You know, these trees, the trees which are in Vrindavan, how can we say that these trees in Vrindavan are in Chandras? Because, you know, they are very excited about Krishna. They are very excited about meeting with Krishna. They are very excited when Krishna is coming, they are bound, going down. Yeah, so I'm, I'm saying that. Some kind of service. I was just saying that. Yeah, I was just saying that these trees are also doing service. They give flowers, they give fruits. This is their service. So how can they? How can we say that they are in Chandra? Well, different places it can be different. You know, you've got some trees with they don't give flowers and fruits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are different kinds of trees. Not every tree is so pious. So, but there is such a thing as Shantaras. And generally we say these kind of creatures are like that, these living entities, like sometimes different cows, different living entities which are there in the spiritual world. They're not, they're not really active in service, but they, they have that mood. They may appreciate the greatness of Krishna, they're attracted by the beauty of Krishna, but they, they don't do any service. Just like some birds, you know, they're sitting on the branches and they're looking at Krishna and they're appreciating the beauty of Krishna. They're enjoying Krishna's attractive features, but they're not doing anything. Some birds are there on the trees like that, They're like great sages meditating on Krishna. So that could be like Shantaras. Okay, we should go ahead. Let's go back to our slide here. Okay, so the unsuccessful yogi. Let's see. Oh, and then at the end of the chapter, the topmost yogi. We'll hear who's at the top of the yoga ladder. All right. So, verses 37 to 45, the destination of the unsuccessful yogi. Arjuna has his question. All right. Hmm. Arjuna said, O Krishna, what is the destination of the unsuccessful transcendentalist who in the beginning takes to the process of self-realization with faith, but who later desists due to worldly mindedness and thus does not attain perfection in mysticism? So Arjuna was worried naturally. Maybe all of us had similar thoughts when we came into Krishna consciousness, that I'm coming into this Krishna consciousness. Now, what happens if I'm not successful? I'm giving up my material, I'm, you know, I'm turning away from the material side of life to concentrate, to put more emphasis on the spiritual side of life. And what happens if I'm not successful? Then I'll lose both. I'm not, if I'm not successful in my spiritual life and I've given up the material life, my old material friends will laugh at me and say, see, you went away from us, you left us, and now you've gone to Krishna and you failed, you didn't, you, you've come back. So Arjuna's question is very relevant, certainly. 
we should think like that. Almighty arm Krishna, does not such a man who is bewildered from the path of transcendence fall away from both spiritual and material success and perish like a riven cloud with no position in any sphere? So, this is certainly a relevant question and Lord Krishna is going to answer it very clearly and explain what happens. Prabhupada explains first, declaring war against Maya, simply improve your chanting and you will be the conqueror. Krishna says, Kunti apritijani hi nami bhakta pranashyati. Just declare, my devotee will never be vanquished by Maya. Maya cannot do anything if we become strong. And what is that strength? Chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, loudly. So loud chanting certainly being recommended here very clearly by Srila Prabhupada. Improve your chanting and you will be the conqueror. So how to improve our chanting? Chant louder. <laughs> hmm. and chant more. Practice, just like we said, abhyasena, abhyas. Practice, we have to practice chanting we have to practice calling out the name of Krishna. Certainly Krishna will respond. Two ways to progress. Those who are materialists have no interest in transcendence. Therefore, they are more interested in material advancement by economic development or in promotion to the higher planets by appropriate work. When one takes to the path of transcendence, one has to cease all material activities and sacrifice all forms of so-called material happiness. In the aspiring, if the aspiring transcendentalist falls, then he apparently loses both ways. In other words, he can enjoy neither material happiness nor spiritual success. So Prabhupada, from his purport here, text number 38, Srila Prabhupada is saying, when we take to transcendence, the path of transcendence, we have to stop material activities and sacrifice all forms of so-called material happiness, right? What are these things? What are these so-called material? What is this material happiness which we have to sacrifice? Did you sacrifice anything? When you came to Krishna, huh? Regulative principles. You you have to you have to follow the regulative principles. Yes, you'd have to do that. But Prabhupada is saying we have to we have to sacrifice all forms of so-called material happiness. Where was this material happiness? What would be this so-called material happiness which we sacrificed? Waking up late in the morning. Waking up late in the morning, sleeping more in the sleeping late in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Associating with mundane people. Yeah, association. We get. But Prabhupada said, you, when we become a devotee, it's like marriage. You, just like before marriage you have your friends and after marriage you have different friends usually, you know, because you're a couple now and it's a bit different. It's not like when you're single. 
Okay, so there is a difference. We have to change the company, association, when we become devotees, and material happiness. Yes, anything else? Anything else you sacrificed in becoming a devotee? Kitty party. What? Going to parties. Really? Going to parties? Yeah. Maybe the way we dress also. The way we yes. dress sometimes. The, the, how we would dress, you know, the, how the ladies and how the men also, how we would dress. When we become devotees and different, I, uh, I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement, of course, in the, in, ninth, in the 1970, early 1970, at that time everyone had long hair. We all had long hair, all the young men had long hair, you know, it was the time of the, the rock groups, the Beatles and things like this. So all the men had long hair. And when we came to Krishna Consciousness, and it was a big thing, you know, are we going to cut our hair, going to shave your head? Oh my goodness, cut all the hair off. <laughs> it was a real sacrifice. And sometimes, some, for some people it was really a challenge, you know. And they would tell them, you know, okay, if, either you shave your head or you go, you're not, you're not staying here. And Prabhupada also had said like that, he didn't want people staying with long hair. And even nowadays we have the problem, sometimes people stay in our centers, they don't like to cut their hair, they, they like to have long hair. But Prabhupada would say, the, uh, these other yogis, they may get their strength from long hair, but in bhakti yoga, bhakti yogi, the bhakti yogis, they get their strength from shaving their head. We get a certain strength that gives you that power that shakti, when you shave your head, cut off your hair. This hair just, so Prabhupada says, it's just like stool, just a byproduct of the body. So Prabhupada liked to see us all clean shaven as well. When Sanatana Goswami came to Lord Chaitanya at Banaras, Sanatana Goswami had been in prison and he'd been working for the Muslims, of course. So when he came to Banaras, he, he had a beard and so on. And so when Lord Chaitanya saw him, Lord Chaitanya told uh, Tapana Mishra, I think, he said, take him and make him clean. <laughs> make him clean. In other words, get his head shaved and face shaved, like that. Prabhupada didn't like to see us also with the long hair. And people had beards also, Prabhupada wanted them to shave. And that was the Krishna consciousness movement, we, we should be clean shaven. And so that's, you know, kind of sacrifice which we have to make. There's some people take pleasure in these things, you know, we have attachments our beards and our hair, it's material, it's not spiritual. Okay, so if the aspiring transcendentalist falls, he loses both ways. That's Arjuna's doubt, right? We'll see. How does Krishna answer? Hmm. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Son of Prita, a transcendentalist engaged in auspicious activities does not meet with destruction either in this world or in the spiritual world. One who does good, my friend, is never overcome by evil. That's text number 40. So first of all, he's a transcendentalist. And he's, as a transcendentalist, he's engaging in activities, though he's doing good. So Lord Krishna said, he doesn't meet with destruction, either in this life or in the spiritual world, if he goes to the spiritual world. 
it's not going to be getting any difficulty because it's being doing good activities. It's mentioned here, right? Nahi kauyana kritkaschit durgatim tatagachati. Kauyana krit, right? What does it mean? Who knows? Auspicious words. Yeah. Kauyan, Kauyana krit. Yeah, he's doing something good. He's doing something auspicious. So, they have the saying in India, we say everywhere, you know, you do good, those who do good will get good. As you sow, so shall you reap. Jaisa karega, aisa barega. Right? Hindi language they say. Mm. Even in China they say like that. They say if you, shan yo shan bao, o yo bao. If, if, if those who do good deeds, they will get good results. And those who do bad deeds, they will get bad results. If you plant beans, you will harvest beans. If you plant melons, you will harvest melons. We cannot expect that it's all one. No, it doesn't matter what you do, everybody gets the same. It's not true. We get the results of our work. So somebody's genuinely been trying, he's been trying, he just wasn't able to fully succeed. But somehow he tried, he would certainly get some benefit, he would get some good result. A transcendentalist engaged in auspicious activities does not meet with destruction. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question here. Yes. Uh, so does this apply like in our Krishna consciousness movement also? Like many people they come, they chant for some time, maybe two rounds, four rounds, or sometimes like some people they chant six rounds, and after that they don't find it interesting or something, and uh, they leave maybe within a few months or few years, one year, two years. So does this apply to them as well, or uh, it's uh, we talked about some different level of people or the, the Yes, well, it will depend on how much they've done and how much th this will be explained. You see, in Krishna's reply, he's going to explain that somebody practices for a short time and somebody practices for a long time. They're going to get different results. Okay. Yeah, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, as they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. So somebody surrenders for a few weeks and somebody surrenders for a few years. So certainly they'll get different results. And somebody chanted a few rounds and somebody chanted a lot of rounds, they'll get different results. But they don't, nobody loses. Whatever, whatever service they've done, whatever progress they've made, that will be with them. It goes in their spiritual bank account and they'll go on from that point in the future. You know, somebody's going to do some devotion in this life and they get so far and so then, oh, then they, they, they complete their, their life finishes, they will take birth in a situation which is conducive for them to continue from the point where they were. You, you will see in a minute, Lord Krishna will explain the different results according to how they practice. Let's see. One who does good is never overcome by evil. In this verse, Krishna reassures Arjuna, saying that for one engaged in auspicious activities, there's no chance of attaining misfortune. There's no chance of attaining misfortune because they've been, they've been engaging in devotional activities. And in the purport, Prabhupada quotes this verse, Takvasva dharmam charanam bhajam from Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, fifth chapter, Narada Muni's instruction to Vyasadeva, 
right? That one who, one may give up his duties to take up Krishna consciousness and he may not, he, he may not be able to maintain Krishna consciousness, he may not be able to keep it up. But still there's no loss because he made an attempt, he made an attempt to try to become Krishna conscious. He couldn't succeed, he couldn't finish the whole thing, but he made an attempt. And so it's better. But on the other hand, what does a man profit if he gain the whole world but lose his eternal soul? Right? Some, somebody at least tried for Krishna consciousness. That that's better than somebody who did never try. They just went on for the material. Do they enjoy? No, they, they just suffer. Material life is just suffering. It's all suffering. People just pretend that they're happy. They're not really happy. They're suffering, miserable. So what is Kalyana Krit? As you say, auspicious activities, Prabhupada explains from the purport. Activity in Krishna consciousness is the only auspicious activity. And anyone who voluntarily accepts all bodily discomforts, just like you were saying, waking up early in the morning, following regulative principles, these things. If we accept all these bodily discomforts for the sake of making progress on the path of Krishna consciousness, can be called a perfect transcendentalist under severe austerity. And because the Eightfold Yoga system is directed towards the ultimate realization of Krishna consciousness, such practice is also auspicious. And no one who is trying his best in this matter need fear, need fear degradation. So a little, just a little advancement on the path saves one from the greatest danger. That is the point to be remembered. And we may think, oh, I'd rather enjoy my material life. Oh, you will. That, but that's not real enjoyment, it's just the illusion of enjoyment there in the material world. We have to be convinced there's no real happiness in this material life. It is just suffering. Prabhupada talks about wet stool and dry stool. It's all stool, whether it's wet or dry. It's all obnoxious, horrible stuff. So the same way material happiness, material enjoyment, go to the higher planets. It's just, there's also anxiety there. There's also difficulties there, problems there. But Krishna consciousness, that is actually auspicious. And we make, a, we accept a little difficulty for that, a little advancement on that path, it, it's so much helpful, so much beneficial for us. So the Eightfold Yoga system is directed towards the ultimate realization of Krishna consciousness. The real purpose of the Astanga Yoga is to come to Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada explains, those who are after fruitive result for sense gratification may be elevated to a higher standard of life, even to the higher planets. But still, because they are not free from material existence, they are not following the truly auspicious path. The only auspicious activities are those which lead one to liberation. And real liberation is to become Krishna conscious. That is actual liberation. We are not just interested in becoming one. That is hell for the devotee. We want to get free of birth and death. We want to enter into the real, the real world, the spiritual world.
So Krishna is not finished? Is it going to explain? The unsuccessful yogi, after many, many years of enjoyment on the planets of the pious living entities, is born into a family of righteous people or into a family of rich aristocracy. This is the yogi who is practiced just for a, for a short time. Right? They practiced for a short time, but they were not successful. So, what happens? He goes to the, hut, the higher planets, planets of the pious living entities. And then he's born into a family of righteous people or into a family of rich ar aristocracy. Why did he go to the higher planets? To, be, because he still had the desire to enjoy. He still wanted some, you know, although he was a devotee, he was unsuccessful in this yoga practice. He practiced for a little while, not for a long time. He was unsuccessful. So, he still has desires for enjoying. So, Krishna sends him to the higher planets, the planets of the pious living entities. In heaven, Swarga Loka, he, go, he goes there and he will enjoy there. And w the nature of all that enjoyment is after you've enjoyed for some time, then it's enough. You don't want it anymore. You become tired of it. Maybe some of you have already experienced that. You've had enough of sense gratification. And you just want to get away from it. You become tired of it. You become tired of sense gratification and all the people that it brings and so on, all the association it brings to you. You just want to get away from that kind of environment, from that kind of association. So then what happens? You come back to earth and you take birth in a family of righteous people or into a family of rich aristocracy. Suchi nam srimatam gehe yoga brasto bijayate. Yoga brasta, the fallen yogi, right? He takes birth in the family. Suchi nam or srimatam gehe, pious people or rich aristocracy. Why? Why would he take birth in that kind of family? Because they are given the, uh, what you call the advantage to take the facility to come back to Krishna? Yes. In, in, in the wealthy family and the pious family or the rich family, there will be the opportunity to study scriptures and to hear from saintly people. Just like we see in India, sometimes the, the rich aristocracy, they will host some sadhu or something at their home. You know, this Swami is coming to give lecture at the home of such and such, the big man. And so many people will come. And pious people, pious living entities, pious means that they go to temples, that they they like to read scriptures, they give charity, like that. So this is that kind of birth, this is for the yogi who practiced for a short time. He just practiced a short time. So he goes first to the higher planets, enjoys there, and then when he's tired of that, then he comes back to earth and he takes birth in a good family. On this path, there is no... Yes? Any question? Maharaj, I have... Yes, I have one question, Maharaj. Uh, we had often seen that devotees of Krishna are, you know, generally very poor. Or, you know, not very aristocratic. Uh, you know, there are very less devotees uh, who are advancing towards pure bhakti and they, are, they belong to very aristocratic families. So, how can we see this? 
because you know whatever we are getting in this life is because of our previous birth karma. So previously, what we had done that we had received bhakti, but we haven't received the aristocracy. And previously, what others had done that they had received the aristocracy, but they haven't received the pure bhakti. So how to distinguish between this? So you know, generally people ask this thing: Why do bad things happen to good people, or something like that? Yes. Well, you get the birth in a good family, it certainly doesn't mean you get bhakti. You still have to work, yeah, because they only did a little bit of bhakti. So they still have a long, they have a long way to go. But whatever bhakti they have, it's there with them. Oh, just a minute, excuse me. Another storm coming up here. So they've got some bhakti, but they didn't have much bhakti, and they're con they're confronted with a lot of sense gratification. But they went to the heavenly planets, and they got tired of sense gratification. They come back, then they're they're born into the the, the wealthy family or something. So they have to go on from there. They have to, again, it, it, it's up to them. They have to want to, they have, they have to take advantage of the association of the saintly people. And they have to be a little determined in their efforts. For them also, they have to have some determination to be able to to see through the glitter of material sense gratification and to go on to something higher. So it's true what you say, people may, they may have the good birth, the noble birth, but no bhakti. But they have the opportunity to get bhakti. If we say it the other way around, like you know, they had done a little, you know, endeavor on this path, so that's why, you know, they they were rewarded as a you know good birth in a good family and got an opportunity to do bhakti. But those who are devotees in this life, they had done you know more vice work, they had done more bhakti in their previous life. That's why they are getting bhakti in this life. But they are not being rewarded with, uh, you know, with, with the material facilities or what to say. So how to see these things? Well, it's Is not, it it's not true, it's, the... it's not true that in every case, we do see, we do see examples of people being rewarded with, with material facilities, but we have to understand Lord Krishna knows what is actually good for that person. Now you see also, we see Kolaveka Sridhar. Now Kolaveka Sridhar in Krishna Lila, he was a gopi, you know, he was a very pure-hearted gopi in Krishna Lila, but he took birth as Kolaveka Sridhar, he's very poor. Why? Well, one reason is Lord Krishna wants to show that it's not necessary that you have to have a lot of material opulence to be a devotee. You can be poverty-stricken and still be a good devotee, and at the same time you can be in a very opulent condition and be a devotee. Devotional service is independent of material circumstances. So Lord Krishna takes advantage of different devotees to put them into different conditions of life. And the devotee has to transcend that, he has to see through these things. And understand that this thing is not very important. To be very wealthy or to be very poor doesn't make a big difference in the eyes of Krishna. What's important is our devotion. Uh, we see Chitraketu, uh, Maharaj Chitraketu, 
that in next life he became uh, like the king of the Vijadharas, right? He was the king of the Vijadharas. He's flying in an airplane. He was given material opulence. And then the next life, he was, he, of course, he became Vritasura. He was cursed to become a very ferocious demon, a big, horrible Asura. So these things are all very temporary. We just simply have to accept whatever condition Lord Krishna puts us in, that he knows what is actually good for us, and he's helping us to come back to him. So you have to keep your, we have to keep ourselves fixed on the path. What is our goal? Where are we trying to go? These temporary, these material situations, they shouldn't be a big problem for someone who is a devotee in Krishna consciousness. Maharaj Prataparudra was the king of Arisa. He was so wealthy, big empire. He was a great devotee. And then Pundarik Vijanidi was a big landowner also. He was a well, very wealthy man. He was very rich. But then you have Suklambar, Suklambar Brahmachari. He just lived by begging some rice whatever rice he could pick up in the street. And then you've got Kolaveka Sridhar. You know, there were some different people, like even Srivas Pandit was also very poor. He didn't have a lot of wealth, but he didn't worry about it. He just depended on Krishna. So that's the mood of the devotee. Do you understand? Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So unsuccessful yogis are divided into two classes. Those who fall after short practice and those who fall after long practice. There's a danger for everyone. Practice the long... Just because we've been around a long time doesn't mean we're going to be successful. We can also fall. We've been here a long time. Still we can fall. We may not be successful. But we get different results. The yogi who falls after a short period is described first. He goes to the higher planets inhabited by pious living entities. Srila Baladev Vijabhusan says, after a prolonged life in which he has the opportunity to enjoy his senses, he again develops a distaste for sense gratification and returns to earth to take birth in a learned family of brahmanas, suchinam, or a wealthy and pious merchants, srimatam. So, what kind of birth do you want? <laughs> you want to be born in that family of brahmanas? Learned brahman family. We have quite a few of them. And pious merchants also, there's quite a few of those kind of people as well. We should understand birth in these families, these people, they must have been practitioners of yoga in their previous life. Not successful. So we can, we can, uh, we can try to preach to them and approach them. But we know it's no guarantee that they're going to be devotees. Sometimes we pick these kind of people, we think, oh, they're very pious, they're very good people, and they have no interest in Krishna consciousness. Anyway, so. But what about somebody who practiced for a long time? If unsuccessful after long practice of yoga, he takes his birth in a family of transcendentalists who are surely great in wisdom. Certainly such a birth is rare in this world. Now Krishna doesn't tell us what's the criterion, what, what's a long time and what's a short time. <laughs> It would be interesting, right? We'll have to speculate on that. What does it mean long practice? And what does it mean short practice? And what, where's, the, where's the boundary? Where do they meet? What about if you're somewhere in between? 
Anyway, practice for a long time. You take birth in a family of transcendentalists, right? Can you think of some people like that who took birth in a family of transcendentalists? Bhakti yes, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, who was born the seminal son of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. Right? How many children did Bhakti, Bhakti Vinod Thakur have? Ten mother. Yeah, at least, maybe Ten. more. I thought twelve. Anyway, great transcendentalist. Bhakti Siddhanta, he was like the fifth child. So certainly a birth, and who else took birth in a family of transcendentalists? Prabhupada. Yes, Prabhupada, right. Prabhupada said his father was a pure devotee. His only business was to worship the deity. He would see his father always worship the deity. Okay, so such a birth is rare in this world. Etadi dulabhataram loke janma yad ishdrisham. Here we have Jad Bharat, Bharat or Bharat Maharaj, perfection after three lifetimes. King Bharat who took his third birth in the family of a good brahmana is an example of good birth for the revival of previous transcendental consciousness. Right? First life he was Bharat Maharaj, then second life he was the deer in the Himalayas, and third life he took birth in the family of a brahmana. But he behaved like he was dumb, so Jad Bharat. From his life it is understood that transcendental endeavours or the practice of yoga never go in vain. By the grace of the Lord the transcendentalist gets repeated opportunities for complete perfection in Krishna consciousness. So as we were saying, people come to Krishna Consciousness and they do service for some time and then they go away. But they're not the loser, it's to their credit and certainly whatever progress, whatever advancement they've made in this life, they'll go on from that point in the future. They never lose the, serve, the benefit, whatever service. They, and here we see Bharat Maharaj. That because he, he was already very advanced, he reached practically the level of Bhav, but somehow he deviated and his, his service became slackened and became attached to the deer. But he never forgot, by the grace of the Lord, he could remember his previous life. And so he went on to take birth again in the family of a Brahmana and he achieved perfection. So we get, Krishna gives us opportunities. Even if we're not able to complete Krishna consciousness, Krishna will give us another opportunity. He'll give us another and another opportunity. And we'll be there. Yes? Stage in this only lifetime, then uh, as in we are not able to complete it, then the Acharya has to come again to take us. Yes, that's what they say. They say that if, we, if we're not going back to Godhead, then the spiritual teacher may come himself or he may delegate someone to come. Not necessary that he personally would come but he may delegate someone else on his behalf to come and help us. So if he sees some 
of his follower, of his disciples having difficulty to get out of the material world, then the spiritual teacher can make arrangements like that to bring us back to Godhead. Yes, and Prabhupada used to say, don't, don't give me all that work. He said, don't, don't give me all that trouble. He said, you should become perfect yourself and go back to Godhead. Don't give me trouble bringing me back here, trying to help you to get out. You follow Krishna consciousness yourself carefully and go back to Godhead. Otherwise you just... Huh? Uh, I was saying like, uh, if the disciple has tried his best, but still he's not able to reach the last stage and his life gets over, then uh, though he has tried his best, but the Acharya has to again take that uh, pain of coming back. And that is very bad. <laughs> yes. Yes, not very good. Certainly. So we want to make all efforts that we, we can be successful in this life. If we do have to come back, if we fail, then the spiritual master can also arrange to come and help us. We see the example there that uh, Bhuva Mangal Thakur. Bhuva Mangal Thakur was a person, he was quite fallen, quite degraded, and he was writing songs and poetry and he had a girlfriend. The girlfriend Chintamani used to sing the songs for him. He would write songs and poems and Chintamani would sing. So Bilva Mango became very attached to this prostitute woman and it happened that one day when he came to her that she said to him, that, oh, if only you had, you're so attached to me, if only you had so much attachment, the same attachment for Lord Krishna. And as soon as she mentioned Lord Krishna's name, it awakened the bhava which was there in Bilva Mango Thakur. And he immediately remembered and he thought, Lord Krishna. And he heard the name of Lord Krishna and he could remember Lord Krishna and he turned around and he left her. And then he went to Vrindavan and he achieved perfection. So he said later, Bilva Mangal Thakur wrote in his song, he described how this Chintamani was actually his spiritual master. He said, my spiritual master came to me in the form of Chintamani. Now, it wasn't necessarily that he actually became Chintamani, but somehow his spiritual master entered into Chintamani and inspired her to speak the, this word, these words about Lord Krishna. So the spiritual master can do like that, that he can empower someone else on his behalf to instruct people, to help them back to Godhead. Right? So it's not that the spiritual master has to personally come and be with us to help us, but he will arrange to give us that impetus to try to direct us out in the material world. Okay, so destination of the unsuccessful yogi. By virtue of the divine consciousness of his previous life, he automatically becomes attracted to the yogic principles, even without seeking them. Such an inquisitive transcendentalist stands always above the ritualistic principles of the scriptures. So, young children born in Krishna consciousness, they're very special. And Srila Prabhupada encouraged us to take very great care of the children born into our Krishna consciousness movement, that these children are not ordinary. And sometimes we will see also 
how they're so attracted to these yogic principles. And, and it's something due to past life. Just yesterday we were celebrating uh, Bhakti Charuswami's uh, Vyasa Puja and they were making that point about Bhakti Charuswami, how he came to Krishna consciousness and he came, he was about 25, maybe, 24, yeah, maybe a bit older than that, no, wait, he's a bit older than me, so, uh, yeah, he came in 1977, so he was, he was in 32 or 33, I think, when he came to Krishna consciousness. So he was immediately attracted to Krishna consciousness and Prabhupada recognized that. And pra that's why Prabhupada gave him first and second initiation and then he gave him sannyas all within a few months. And Prabhupada, when the devotee said, Prabhupada is a very new devotee, and Prabhupada said he's very pure since birth. So Srila Prabhupada understood his nature, that he, he, that due to previous life, he was, he had a natural inclination to Krishna consciousness. And we, we see other examples. We see, of course, Raghunath Das Goswami. Raghunath Das was also born in very great wealth, amid so much wealth and opulence. But he gave it all up. He had no attraction for it. They wanted to tie him up. But the mother and the, the, the father said, what good is it to tie him up? He has a wife more beautiful than the goddess of fortune and he has wealth greater than Indra the king of heaven and he's not happy, he doesn't like it, he doesn't want either of them. So what good are ropes? So we have to understand some people they have this from their previous birth, from their previous life and they're born into that situation and so they will immediately be attracted to the yogic principles. If you meet people like that, then it's not difficult to preach to them. They can immediately accept, they immediately have that interest. Of course, people are rare. There's not so many people like that. It's rare. Okay, spontaneous spirit, spiritual attraction. His previous practice, Purva Bhyasa, automatically attracts him, Riyate Hyavasha, and he remains attracted, right? He remains attracted despite his previous obstacles he faced. His being transcendental to Shabda Brahma are above the ritualistic principles of the scriptures, refer to his being above the karma kanda rituals leading to material enjoyment. He is attracted to spiritual, not material life. All right, you can see these words, purva bhyasa sena, purva abhyasena tainaiva riyate yavashopisa. By virtue of his divine consciousness of his previous life, he automatically becomes attracted to the yogic principles. So th these words are used here. Finally, the next verse explains how and when the yogi will achieve the ultimate goal. Six forty-five. And when the yogi engages himself with sincere endeavor, making further progress, being washed of all contaminations, then ultimately achieving perfection after many, many births of practice, he attains the supreme goal. So after many, many births of practice, oh yeah, <laughs> maybe we have a long way to go.
But Prabhupada encourage us, encourages us in this very lifetime, we have to go back to Godhead. So sincere endeavor, making progress, washed of all contamination, ultimately achieving perfection, we attain the supreme goal. Sincere endeavor is required to become successful. A yoga brasta, yogi who has fallen from his practice, must work harder than yogis who have practiced longer. Why? Can you understand this sentence? To become successful, a yoga brasta, a fallen yogi, must work harder than yogis who have practiced longer. Right? The, somebody's practiced a short time and somebody's practiced a long time. Who's going to have to work harder? Those who have practiced for a short, short time. time. Right, yes, right. They've only practiced a short time. Somebody's practiced a long time, you, they, they take birth in the pious family. So if you take birth in such a pious religious family, then it's, if you're born in a family of devotees, it's so much easier. You know, Raghunath Das, he wasn't, his family were a little devotee, but they didn't want him to be a devotee. They were trying to bring him back. Bring him back, don't let him be a devotee. So that's problem. We, we see many devotees like that. They, the parents don't want them to become Krishna conscious. Oh no. Why you go why religious? Oh why religious? Even in India, even among Hindu families, they don't want their children to be devotees. Okay? So why? Because rigid rig, rigid practice pray pray is more difficult to achieve from a suchinam birth, birth in a pious religious family, or a srimatam birth, birth in a rich mercantile or royal family, than from a birth in a yoginam dimatam family, a family of transcendentalists possessing great wisdom. Children born in families of transcendentalists receive especially deep Krishna conscious impressions and training early in their spiritual life. So Prabhupada described his life was like that. He learned everything while he was a child and certainly Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati also. So that's a very fortunate birth, I don't know. Maybe some of you were also born like that. So the topmost yogi, here's the yoga ladder. Karma yoga on the bottom, rather karma kanda on the bottom, right? Karma kanda. And then karma yoga, jnana yoga. From jnana yoga you can go to Brahman or you can go back. And you can also go on. Jnana Yoga can lead to Dhyana Yoga, Paramatma Realization, then Bhakti Yoga. So here's the description of these different stages on the yoga ladder. Hmm? So we'll begin with the description on Karmakanda. Karmakanda, one performs actions considering himself as a doer, an enjoyer of the fruit of action, attaining swarg and worldly happiness. It binds the doer to the material world. Karmakanda does not lead one to union with the Lord. It is condemned in all shastra. It is it envies. It, it is envious of oneself and of other. No, typing is not wrong. Some words missing out there in that sentence. 
It shows envy of it shows envy of oneself and of others. So everyone understands karma kanda does not lead to union with the Lord. It is condemned in all shastra. Of course, it's there in the shastra, <laughs> but it's for less intelligent people. Then Karma, Raj, why does it say envy of oneself and of others? I didn't understand that part. Well, the envy of others is easy to understand, right? Yes, yes, Maharaj. We want to get material things, we envy others, they've got material things, I want to get it, why they've got it, I should have it too. And the envy of one's own self is understanding, we have to understand our, our, who we actually are, our spiritual self, the need of the soul. So our thinking is just only of the body. So we're not appreciating the actual need of the soul. And we want to deny this, the spiritual aspect of life and just focus fully on materialism. So this is just another envy of our own self, envy of our spiritual existence. We want to avoid that. So that's what it means. Thank you, Maharaj, it's clear. All right, then karma yoga, niskam karma yoga, is selfless action offered to the Lord, no fruit for sense gratification. Purpose of attaining eternal bliss plus Krishna, karma plus, plus karma kanda. Purpose of attaining eternal bliss plus karma kanda. In other words, you enjoy the result. Purification of heart, realization of soul, and start of detachment. The, the result of karma yoga. We purify the heart, we begin to understand the soul, and we start to become detached. That's important for us. So this is usually where we begin, karma yoga. Our devotional path begins like this. We get some purification of the heart, we start to understand our spiritual identity, and gradually we get some detachment. Then jnana yoga, jnana is knowledge plus vairagya is added to karma yoga. Realization of the super soul, knowledge, this is this is Jnana Yoga. We want to realize the super soul, we want to cultivate knowledge, we should know about the three modes of nature, how they're binding us, how they're acting on us. We should understand our spiritual identity, spiritual position, controlling the senses, all of these things. And then Astanga Yoga, meditation on the Lord is added to Jnana Yoga. Senses and mind control, meditation of Vish on Vishnu. So Astanga Yoga like that. Then finally Bhakti Yoga, love, affection, convinced, convinced faith and meditation on devotion. Okay, so these are the different stages on the yoga ladder. We mentioned some other points and just go through these on the bottom. A part of the sadhana of Niskam Karma Yoga is Astanga Yoga. So Astanga Yoga can also be practiced. Astanga Yoga is, we don't discourage people from doing Astanga Yoga because it, it's a part of the sadhana of Niskam Karma Yoga. So it, it can help one to control the mind and senses in the beginning.
then guna yukta jana the Lord's birth and activities are temporary and His form is material. Take shelter of mundane logic and reasoning. They reject the principle of transcendental knowledge, have no realization of chit shakti, chit tattva. So this is a level of knowledge called guna yukta gyan. They're thinking Krishna's birth and activities temporary, His form material. So you can understand. Then coming ahead, B3, guna titi gyan means meditation on Vishnu. And then we understand the Lord's birth and activities are eternal and consider his deity form to be Satchitananda and desire to destroy gross and subtle bodies to get bliss of Brahman, the bliss of liberation. And meditation on Vishnu transforms in loving service, serves external form of Vishnu attains Vaikuntha. These are different levels on the yoga ladder. Describing about Karmakanda here, what is being discussed is in relation to slaughtering animals, just like uh, there are many systems of religion in which animal sacrifices are recommended. Animal sacrifices inauspicious for the performer and for the animal. So, so many things about that. Of course, we wouldn't. Some places they still do that. And people quote that, so no, you can do it, it's okay. You can offer to Kali, it's the order, it's the order of the scriptures. It's not, it's not the order of the personality of Godhead. When we say you can eat meat, if you sacrifice a goat on the full moon, on the dark moon night before the goddess Kali, this is not the instruction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It may be in scriptures, but it's in scriptures for people who are in the mode of ignorance. Just like there are Puranas, some Puranas are in the mode of goodness, and some Puranas are for people in the mode of ignorance, as well as passion. And so when it, when it talks about slaughtering animals, this is scriptures which are for people in the mode of ignorance and passion. So, as stated here, it is simply a concession for the miserable person who will not give up eating meat. It is meant to restrict his desire for unrestricted meat eating. So such a religious system is condemned. Therefore Krishna says, Sarva Dharmam Pari Krishna. So Krishna said, give up this kind of religion, material religion. The yoga ladder may be compared to a ladder for attaining the topmost spiritual realization. This ladder begins from the lowest material condition of the living entity and rises up to perfect self-realization in pure spiritual life. According to various elevations, different parts of the ladder are known by different name. But all in all, the complete ladder is called yoga. When we speak of yoga, we refer to linking our consciousness with the Supreme Absolute Truth. Such a process is named differently by various practitioners in terms of the particular method adopted. When the linking process is predominantly in fruitive activities, it is called Karma Yoga. When it is predominantly empirical, it is called Jnana Yoga, and when it is predominantly in devotional relationship with the Lord, it is called Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga or Krishna Consciousness is the ultimate perfection of all yogas. And Srila Prabhupada explains the yoga ladder. And so, okay, he explains, you can read from the purport, text number 47. Combination of yoga practice, bhakti yoga. And then from the beginning, karma yoga to the end of bhakti yoga, 
is a long way to self-realization. Karma Yoga without fruit of results is the beginning of this path. In other words, Niskam Karma Yoga. And when Karma Yoga increases in knowledge and renunciation, that's Jnana Yoga. When Jnana Yoga increases meditation on the Super Soul, then that is Astanga Yoga. And when we come to the point of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that is Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is the goal. But to analyze Bhakti Yoga minutely, one has to understand these other yogas. So one who knows Bhakti Yoga, we should know the other yogas. We should know them. Yes, the gradual progress of yoga system, karma yoga to jnana, karma yoga means fruit of activities, pious activities, or prescribed activities. Then by performing karma yoga, one comes to the platform of jnana, jnana yoga, knowledge, and from knowledge to astanga yoga, jnana yoga, then from astanga, concentrating the mind of Vishnu to the point of bhakti yoga. Activities performed in full knowledge strengthen one's advancement in real knowledge. This is from 5th chapter, verse number 2. Activities performed in full knowledge strengthen one's advancement in real knowledge. So we want to develop knowledge. We give this statement here to show the connection between activities performed, that's karma yoga, in full knowledge strengthen one's advancement in real knowledge. So from karma yoga you come to jnana yoga. You can see how the connection is made there. The more we have knowledge, then we will come in the beginning we're doing activities and then with knowledge we'll come to Jnana Yoga. People often do things, they don't know why they're doing it. Some people chant, why are you chanting? I don't know, they told me to do it, I just do it. They're not going to get so much benefit. But if you know why you're chanting, you get more benefit. Why are you a vegetarian? I don't know, that's all they give me to eat, they don't tell me. Huh? I, I don't mind. they just give me vegetarian, I don't know why I'm a vegetarian. Then they get some benefit, but you get more benefit if you know why. And then when karma yoga increases in knowledge and renunciation, this stage is called jnana yoga. So knowledge and renunciation bring you from karma yoga to jnana yoga. Jnana Yoga means to keep in touch with the Supreme by speculation of higher knowledge, that discrimination, what is spirit and what is matter. Prabhupada is describing Jnana Yoga. So we are also Jnanis, but we are not impersonalists. Generally the Jnana Yogis, they are all impersonalists and their goal is to merge into the oneness. Our focus is on bhakti. When jnana yoga increases in meditation on the super soul by different physical processes and the mind is on him, it is called astanga yoga. So you come from jnana yoga to astanga yoga by meditating on the super soul. So we, we don't want to just remain a jnani. With Gyan, we will hear about the Super Soul, and then we should want to meditate on the Super Soul. So, this brings us to the Jnana Yoga, and then from Jnana Yoga, you come to Bhakti Yoga. Here you can see in the picture, Prabhupada's chanting his Gayatri Mantra. Such a yogi engages in the worshipable service of the Super Soul, knowing that I and the Super Soul are one. Are we one with the Super Soul? Yeah. Are we the Super Soul? No, Maharaj. So what's our relationship? 
Right, yes. Krishna is the master, we are the servant. So the yogi engages in the service of the super soul, knowing that I and the super soul are one and at the same time different. So one in quality, different in quantity, different in position. Such a yogi turns into a pure devotee and cannot bear to live for a moment without seeing the Lord within himself. So it's a very advanced yogi, seeing the, yogi, seeing the Lord within himself. Okay, so karma yoga. What do we have to do to do karma yoga? Someone, anybody know? Some qualities of the karma yogi? Uh, we have to uh, do considering things as a matter of duty, not for uh, getting the results out of it. Yes, it good. Yeah. Work it, do things, whatever is our duty, prescribed duty. Yes. But also, what about Krishna? We should be attached to Krishna, right? Detached. Karma yogis, are they detached? Can they be detached? A bit. They have to work for Krishna. Karma yogi, detached. Detached from the results of the work. Because they have, we're talking about niskam karma yogi. So detached from the results of the work. And how to be detached from the results of the work? There should be attachment to Krishna. Jnana Yogi, what's his qualification? What does he do? What is he going to do? Yes? Anybody? Jnana Yogi? He, he analyzes the difference between what is permanent and what is temporary. Yes. He knows about Krishna's energies. Right? He knows what's te permanent, what's temporary. This is Jnana Yoga. You hear about Jnana Yoga, you hear in the final section of the Bhagavad Gita, there's more on Jnana Yoga. Also, we should know about our own relationship with Krishna. This is Jnana Yoga, understanding relationships, Krishna's energy, our relationship. And then Jnana Yoga. What do they do? They perform various, uh, uh, follow rules and regulations and have various sitting postures by my, my, the objective is controlling mind and focusing on the super soul within. Okay. Engage, engage senses. You see, we're talking about bhakti yoga. We're seeing how bhakti yoga contains the components. So how do we as bhakti yogis contain these things, right? Bhakti yogi, karma, he does karma yoga, works for Krishna. Working for Krishna, that's karma yogi. We also work, for, we can also work for Krishna. And then knowledge, we should know about Krishna, everything in relation to Krishna. And dhyana yoga, engaging in the service engaging in service to Krishna. So for, for a devotee, this is how we practice karma yoga, jnana yoga and dhyana yoga. Engage the mind in remembering Krishna, engage the senses in service to Krishna. Karma yoga is attachment to Krishna, there should be some attachment to Krishna. Maybe you're not working for Krishna, you, you, karma yogi, they, they like to do the work, there. they have their own work to do. But still, within their heart, they should think of Krishna. Devotees are attached to Krishna. You work in a job, you have some duty, you have some job to do, okay, but you do it for Krishna, attachment to Krishna. So devotee, one who's a devotee, he's a karma yogi, he's a jnana yogi, he's a dhyana yogi, and he's also a bhakti yogi. All of these things are there within the bhakti yogi, for the bhakti yogi. Prabhupada explains, 
Factually, bhakti yoga is the ultimate goal. But to analyze bhakti, yogi, bhakti yoga minutely, one has to understand these other yogas. The ultimate goal is bhakti. To analyze bhakti yogi, we have to understand the other yogas. So it's important for us to know about these other yoga. So if somebody says, why shall I take advantage of this elevator? I shall go step by step. He can go, but there is chance. If you take the bhakti yoga, immediately you take the help of the elevator. And within a second, you are on the hundredth floor. Direct process. All right, somebody is saying, well, I, I will just walk up the stairs. So that will take a long time, a lot of trouble. Better, one should work for Krishna. One should work for Krishna. Take the elevator up. This is devotee, right? We don't walk up the stairs, we take the elevator. Quickly you get to the top, save the trouble. So we, we don't have to do karma yoga, dhyana yoga, and jnana yoga, dhyana yoga. We just go direct to bhakti yoga. And by coming to, by doing bhakti yoga, automatically the other qualities are all developed in the heart of the devotee. Just by doing bhakti yoga properly, we will also be karma yogis and jnana yogis and dhyana yogi. All these qualities will develop. We just have to do bhakti yoga. So, here's the final verse. Oh. Yoginam apisarvesham madgatim antaratmanam shadavan bhajate yomam same yuta tamon mata Of all yogis, the one with great faith who always abides in me, thinks of me within himself and renders transcendental loving service to me, he is the most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. That is my opinion. So Lord Krishna is saying, who is at the top here? You can see uh, the Himalayas. If one is fortunate enough to come to the point of <laughs> To the point of, what? If one is fortunate to come to the point of bhakti yoga, it is to be understood that he has surpassed all other yogas. Therefore, to become Krishna conscious is the highest stage of yoga. Right? If we are actually Krishna conscious, we have passed all of these other yoga systems. So we have to come, be, be worthy. Krishna consciousness is the last link in the yoga ladder. This link that binds us to the Supreme Person, Lord Sri Krishna. Without this final link, the chain is practically useless. So Prabhupada's concludes statement here. Without coming to the point of bhakti yoga, all these other yoga things are useless. So we can ask you any points of significance you learned from Unit 1? <laughs> Did you learn anything significant here from our classes which we've been giving? Anyone? Maharaj, I learned a very important thing about mind control, like uh, the what you taught, you know, the thing that you know you said uh, it struck me very nicely the that we are uh, training devotees to be gladiators in the arena of japa that that one really struck me maraj and how you said how to beat the mind with the shoes and beat the mind with the broom so that 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 part really struck me maraj okay so thank you you learned you got something significant from the unit very good all right, anybody else, anything? Okay, let's see what we discovered today. The destination of unsuccessful yogis, right? If you're a yogi for a short time, where will you go? 
What's your destination? You plan to Huh? Heavenly planets manage. You go to where the pious people dwell in the higher planets, yes? Why? Uh, because material desires are still there. Yes, right. So you get sense gratification there for some time. And then? You just stay there? And then when we uh, like enjoy it sufficiently, we feel disgusted uh, because the uh, limit is over and then uh, we take birth again in the family of either uh, pious people or rich people. Yes, right. And then we hope you come to Krishna consciousness. And, <laughs> but if you practice for a long time, what happens? Where do you take your birth? You practice for a long time but still not successful? You are born in the family as residential is marriage. Yes. And then what happens? We'll get the wisdom and uh, we'll go to the path of Krishna consciousness. Yes, from birth. Like Prabhupada said, his whole life never even tasted tea. Right? He said so many of his friends, so many of the other people, his classmates and so on, they did all sinful things. But he never even tasted tea. He had no attraction. And one time he went to Jagannath Puri after he studied at college and he graduated. He went to Jagannath Puri. He wanted to see, he went to visit one of his father's friends and the man had cooked meat for him. And Prabhupada saw that he said, Oh, I cannot eat this. I cannot eat this. And the man was surprised. He thought, he said, Oh, I thought it was some very good. I was giving you good food. He said, No, no, I'm vegetarian. And so from birth, Prabhupada had that nature. So no attraction to sinful life. So that's due to past birth. So then we spoke about the yoga ladder also, we described the yoga ladder. Final statement by Prabhupada, anyone who preaches the gospel of Bhagavad Gita to the people of the world, he is the most dear, the dearest person in the world to Krishna. So therefore our duty is to preach the principles of this Bhagavad Gita, to make people Krishna conscious. People are suffering for want of Krishna consciousness. Therefore, each and every one of us should be engaged in the preaching work of Krishna consciousness for the benefit of the whole world. From Prabhupada's lecture in 1966 in New York, from the fourth chapter, verses 14 to 19. So nothing has changed. This, the same need is there. People are suffering for want of Krishna consciousness. There's a great need for people to teach whatever we know of this Krishna consciousness. Pass it on. Okay, so we'll stop here today. Are there any questions or comments? How are you? Jai. Krishna Premi, how are you? Hare Krishna Maharaj, by the by your mercy Maharaj, fine. And where is Tosi Krishna Priya? Tosi Krishna Priya. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Oh, you're here, okay. <laughs> how are you? Are you okay today? I'm doing good. Our frontliner, eh? You're the frontliner there. What are you? Are you a nurse or something? Working as a pharmacist over here, Marie. Oh, working in a pharmacy, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you must be busy. A lot of customers, huh? Mm -hmm. People buying a lot of medicines this time. This time. <laughs> <laughs> good, good business for the pharmacy. The doctors and the pharmacies—they're doing good business. Everybody else, no, no business. Okay.
So very nice to have your association. Thank you very much for all your time. And I wish you all good luck in the future with your Bhakti Shastri. Right? Please go on, continue and study nicely. And then you teach. After you study, then you teach. Whatever you learn, you can teach it to others. That's very nice. Prabhupada will be very pleased. And when you teach, then you, you, you learn it better, you learn more. Okay, so thank you very much for your association, for your time. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Go back. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hope to see you. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. I'll see you in Mayapur when you come to Mayapur. Come and visit me. Yes, Maharaj. By your blessings, Maharaj. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hari Bo. Yeah, come in. Just finish that class. I don't have to do it next week.